thank you for um, having us today. That I'm representing, of course, the Central Park Conservancy. Uh, I do have a cold. I think you can probably hear that. So <laughs> I apologize. Um, but I am here to talk about um, the most visited park in the world. Uh, we get 42 million visits. Um, if any of you have not been there, well, of course, you're coming this week. And um, hopefully you will come back. Uh, I think the northern part of the park where we're having our um, tours and, and workshops uh, will be a new experience, even if you're a New Yorker, because most New Yorkers never go up at the north end. And it's really the most surprising and the most unusual and not what you probably think about at all. So um, having said that, um, we'll just go through a brief history of the park. OK, this is what it looked like in 1857 when they took um, about 770 acres of rocky, swampy land in midtown Manhattan. There were hardly any trees. Um, the British, who um, came and moved in, and New York City, most people don't realize, during the American Revolution, New York City was the second largest British city in the world after London. And um, fortunately, we won, or we would all have British accents, uh, which might be nice. Uh, nonetheless, um, they cut down all the trees during those eight years in New York City. So um, the, everything you see in New York, except at the New York Botanical Gardens, is actually second or third growth um, trees in New York. Um, the um, Irish built the park. I like to say it's why it's so green. Uh, that's because um, they were the immigrants and the laborers and about 3,500 people started in 1857 building the park. Um, it had almost no technology that um, was any different than building the pyramids. Uh, they had gunpowder, dynamite hadn't been invented yet. And of course, when you come to the park, you'll see all those rock outcrops that had to be blasted in order to make the roads and the pathways. And of course, they left a great deal of the rock as um, for, for you photographers, us photographers. But um, it's all man-made. Everything you see in Central Park was planned, planted, and placed. Um, it looks like um, a natural landscape. Of course, it has real rocks and real trees and real flowers and real plants. But in fact, it's all been planned. I like to say that Central Park is closer to Disneyland than it is to Yosemite. And, um, and I would be true. All those water bodies are no different than your kitchen sink or your bathtub. We turn them on and we turn them off. And um, that happens repeatedly. So here is the landscape that was Olmsted and Vox's design competition, winning uh, in 1858. Um, they added the uh, to 110th Street. Originally, it only went up to 106th Street. So actually, the Harlem Mirror, where you'll be this week, um, was not an original part of the park. It's a beautiful design. Um, I like to say that Central Park is America's most important work of art of the 19th century, and one of the most important works of art of America of any time. Um, people go, what do you mean it's a work of art? Well, it was all planned, actually, for photographers when photography wasn't so popular or it was too new. But when you take out your camera to photograph something, you think you're so clever and you're composing so perfectly. I'm talking about myself as well, of course. And that's because Olmsted and Vox, Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox, are the designers who made those views. So we think we're so clever and creative. But in fact, we have to tip our hats to the designers who made it so. Um, there, the park is a beautiful tapestry, and there are um, three ways to get around the park. There's the carriage drives, which now are hardly anymore the automobile drives. They're almost all gone, except in the southern part of the park. So um, they probably didn't have baby blue carriages in the 19th century. They didn't. They were all black. But at any rate, you can still ride a horse in a carriage in Central Park on the drives. There are five miles 
of Bridal Trail, uh, the last uh, stable, public riding stable closed in 2008, but there are stables on the west side and just this year, horses have come back to the Bridal Trail in Central Park. Uh, which we're happy about. And of course, there are 58 miles of pedestrian paths. Originally, there were 28 miles, but uh, they added swimming pools and playgrounds and the Great Lawn used to be a reservoir. So all of those things added more pathways to the park, but more pathways for you to walk and enjoy and take pictures. So um, the park has three ways to get around it and basically three different types of landscapes. The first are the infinite meadows and the infinite lakes. They wanted you to come into the park. Remember, in the 19th century, the park was nowhere near the city. The city was below 34th Street, for the most part, even below that, 14th Street. And they wanted you to get a sense of space because all those cramped, crowded quarters in New York City were so awful and dirty and polluted. And so they wanted you to come out and get a big sense of space. So they made as much as possible meadows. And of course, Sheep Meadow got its name because it had a flock of sheep until 1934. Here it is today. Um, my back is to the famous skyline because I wanted you to see it the way they designed it with this infinite sense of space. Uh, of course, the lake, as I told you, is nothing more than a bathtub, but there it is with just the emerging skyline about, above it. And today it is pretty much the exact same. We have restored it, but it gives you a huge sense of pleasure and peacefulness and placid water. Then there are the formal landscapes. So we've done the pastoral. The formal landscapes are the ones that are clearly man-made. Mother Nature does not plant trees in a straight line. So we have the mall, and uh, here it is today. Those are the third planting of American elms. They are the most hort important horticultural feature in Central Park. Um, the, um, Dutch elm disease has killed off all these beautiful LAs throughout the country, and Central Park's 90-year-old trees are the last remaining a major stand of the original American elms. So they're at the southern part. You won't go there this week, but do go there because they're magnificent and a photographer's dream come true. And then right beyond it is the formal landscape of Bethesda Terrace and the famous Angel of the Waters Fountain that celebrates the fresh water that came from the Croton River uh, 38 miles north of New York City when that basically um, improved New York City's water condition after terrible cholera epidemics and made New York City a great city because with the bad water system, no one wanted to live there. Once we had water back in the 18, 42, New York started becoming uh, the city it is today. And last of all, we have acres of woodlands. This is right in this 19, 18, um, the 70s, uh, Bankrock Bay. We have waterfalls, um, a whole series of them at the north end of the park where you'll be. Uh, what you're looking at is a concrete wall lined with artfully placed boulders blasted from the rock outcrops and New York City drinking water flowing over it. But the idea was that you could go to the Adirondacks after a day's work, and that's just what this looks like. And it was also um, at the same time that America was developing the Hudson River School of Painting that celebrated our magnificent landscapes. And they wanted Central Park to be that a series of those magnificent landscapes in 843 acres, and they succeeded, particularly in the woodlands where you have no idea you're in New York City. That's basically on the corner of 6th Avenue and about 103rd Street, but you wouldn't know it um, by being there, and we hope you'll please come and photograph. And this is one of the greatest um, feats of engineering in the park, the road, the Carriage Drive goes right over it. It is a bridge built of those blasted rocks, 
There is absolutely no mortar holding these stones together. That's the Roman arch system. It's called Huddle Stone Arch because the stones are all huddling together to form it. And it's been working since 1866. It's either like Humpty Dumpty putting it all back together again. And um, it's magnificent. And you go under it, and you see that waterfall that I just showed you. And of course, Central Park is a, the greatest outdoor museum of Victorian decorative arts. We have it all over the park. Calvert Fox and his designer, Jacob Raymond, did gorgeous cast iron buildings and little shelters like this, a ladies' pavilion. They're all over the park. Cast iron was a brand new material, and they could make filigree designs. They went to town. And that's um, Art Deco, um, Art Nouveau, 40 years before Art Nouveau. This is bridge number 28, not a particularly romantic name. But um, it's you near know, the tennis courts. If you go take a walk after you've been uptown, Try to find this bridge, it's so beautiful. And um, we have rustic work throughout the park, lots and lots of new rustic work. We have incredible rustic craftsmen. And um, of course, beautiful fountains and 51 sculptures and monuments throughout the park. A tiled ceiling, the only mitten tile ceiling in the world. They are meant for floors, if you go to the Capitol in Washington, I'm sure you've seen the mint and tile on the floor. We're the only people in the world that have it on the ceiling. And at Bethesda Terrace, this amazing group of carvings that re represent the seasons of the year. And um, so here's the mall back in around 1900. And the park started slowly going into a decline. This is the same place that um, that was, that picture was, only 25, 30 years later. Um, the city started building other parks. They started having fiscal crises. And no one started taking care of the park. Olmsted and Vox and their successors had died. And the place started going downhill because it's an entirely man-made landscape. And if you don't take care of it, then it's going to fall apart. And that's just what happened from the 1920s in particular to some of these pictures, which I personally took starting when I started in 1984. And the Central Park Conservancy, the nonprofit organization that manages, raises the money, and um, maintains the park, was only four years old. And the parks department was depleted, and the city had no money. And this organization formed because a lot of citizens looked at these pictures and said, this is a national disgrace, whereas once Central Park was a national landmark and, and everyone was proud of it, it had fallen into disrepair. Johnny Carson was talking about mugging jokes every single night on The Tonight Show, and nobody wanted to go to Central Park. It was the last place. In fact, when I heard about my job, I thought, ooh, it's so creepy. I lived in Brooklyn and always went to Prospect Park, which didn't have that kind of bad reputation. So just to bring you up to date, a bunch of private citizens got together to raise private money for the park. That's just how it is today. That's Betsy Rogers, the founder of the Conservancy, with Ed Koch, the mayor. Um, she's not touching his head. He's bending down to throw a fish to the seals at the zoo the day that she was named Central Park Administrator. And that's Gordon Davis behind her, the commissioner. And the two of them, or the three of them, formed this public-private partnership that has now been replicated throughout the world. Um, every park, if all of you come from someplace with a park, and um, all of those urban parks were in desperate need of repair. And we're the model that is now helping parks around the world, around the country, even around the city, um, to teach people how to raise private money if your city cannot do it. Because the quality of life and the quality of the economics of a city really depends on public-private partnerships. And so the president, which was Betsy and is now Doug Blonsky, my boss, um, is wears two hats. One, where he reports to the private board of 
um, trustees and one where he reports to the commissioner, who is, of course, a mayoral appointee. And then everyone who works for Central Park reports to him or reported to Betsy because he's both a city official and a private official. And um, in 1998, after many years of operation, 18 years I think it is, we finally signed a contract with the city and um, now we're official. And here is how it works. Um, yes, 25% only since 2014 has the city given Central Park that much money. It used to be 13, 18%. It wasn't very much at all. And we still, the Central Park Conservancy, have to do the heavy lifting of re raising and spending 75% of the money that um, maintains and restores Central Park. This year alone is $64 million just to mow the grass, pick up the garbage, prune the trees. That's not the improvements, not the new landscapes, not the new playgrounds. So that's separate, and that's most of our money that we raise as well. So this is why, um, for all of you, I am deputizing you to tell people that you know in New York, love Central Park, photograph in it, jog in it, bring the kids to the playgrounds, walk their dog, that if they think that Central Park is beautiful, safe, and magnificent because of their tax dollars, tell them they are only 25% correct. The rest of it is the Central Park Conservancy. Like all of us in this room, membership starts at $50. That's, you know, hard, not even a dollar a week to maintain this national treasure. So there's the advertisement, and now I'm going to brag about the 30 five, 36 years of improvements. This was your average light in Central Park. We did, redesigned it to have a beautiful light that matches all those gorgeous Victorian decorations. Your average bench in 1979. Central Park starts at the curb, not at the wall. All six miles around it are, are Central Park, and we have to maintain it. That's what it looked like, and that's the way it looks today. Every entrance was a disgrace, so you didn't even want to walk into it. And now each entrance is a garden unto itself, um, often paid for by the people who face it and collect money from their buildings to pay for the entrance. This is the mall and the concert ground, which now looks like this. And Bethesda Terrace, that beautiful fountain I showed you, and the whole um, beautiful carvings and everything looks gorgeous. There's this tile ceiling before and after. The tiles were in, in um, storage for 30 years until we could get what wound up being $4 million to improve it. This is the Dairy of Visitor Center that had been a little um, kind of the park's 19th century fast food place. And today it's a visitor center put with the uh, beautiful Victorian porch put back on. Belvedere Castle, when you're in New York, and I'm sure many of you are, listen to TV or the radio, and it says the weather in Central Park is. The weather has been taken from this building since 1919, but in Central Park since 1864. Those are weather instruments at the top of Belvedere Castle. That's at 79th Street. And um, behind it are the, all the other weather instruments. But um, we are still happy to you know, be in the news 50 times a day with the weather. And uh, where you'll be tomorrow or uh, this week is um, the Harlem Mirror. This is the, the disgraceful old boathouse that um, had fallen into repair, had burned down, was just um, unsafe and dangerous today. It's a beautiful visitor center. Uh, we have free fishing programs. We used to have to stock the lake with fish in the beginning, but now they all reproduced. And we have a catch and release program. We just asked you to throw it back. This is that famous sheep meadow. Uh, in 1979, there's a garbage truck on the meadow. Now we don't even allow dogs on the meadow. But nobody was paying attention, and no one was caring for the landscape. 
And uh, today, of course, it has been green for 36 years. That's because that construction fence was that we put around it during construction never got taken down and we started imposing rules. And people at first didn't like it, but then when they saw that it kept it green, people get it now and very respectful. Here's the Great Lawn, which used to be a reservoir. This is where all the famous concerts are. Green since 1997, the East Meadow. There was no grass in the park, absolutely none. Graffiti covered every surface, and now um, we've brought back the woodlands and the shoreline, and um, the, the, the erosion of the island had gone, and now we've created an island. We raised, you know, lowered the water, created an island, put back the water. And uh, the shoreline all around the lake has beautiful plantings. And that Phragmites, the, the sign of an unhealthy landscape, um, had clogged the waterways. And now we brought that back. And here's this really ugly scene that today is a beautiful scene. And that, that's a, basically 77th Street on the west side. And you go into the ramble, the woodlands in there. Uh, and this is some new projects that we just opened uh, at 50, right at 59th Street, the Hallett Nature Sanctuary that had been closed off since 1934. And now we've opened it to the public. Many of you might have read about it in the New York Times a few weeks ago. And um, we have rebuilt all the boat landings around the park that had fallen apart. And um, this is Hallett again, that nature sanctuary. This is what it looked like about um, five years ago. And today you can go in and see the most beautiful woodlands and rustic, that rustic overlook and seasonal plantings. Uh, here is that waterfall I showed you earlier. And here it is today. And the reservoir. Um, I think it should have a fence. Well, there was an ugly chain link fence around it, and we found a donor who wanted to give 106 acres back to Central Park by lowering the fence and taking away the barbed wire and chain link. Um, they opened it up, and now we added um, the most beautiful skyline is from the top end of the reservoir, looking over the whole reservoir with a shooting fountain in the entire skyline of New York. And our playgrounds, we have 21 perimeter playgrounds, all improved and um, because our children's first experiences are often in our playgrounds. And at Grand Army Plaza, the main entrance to the park and the only official corner of all four corners to the park is Grand Army Plaza. We just redid Augustus St. Gaudens Sherman and fixed the landscape. And Conservatory Garden, which you will all go to, which um, here it is May or April, and there is nothing except the few flowering trees. And today, um, this is what it looked like a couple of weeks ago, but there are perennial beds and new annuals and beautiful fountains. I think you're gonna love it. And um, Shakespeare Garden on the west side was this crumbling mess. And today it has beautiful flowers, seasonal and uh, rustic furniture. And here's Larry, the Shakespeare gardener. He, he has one of the best jobs in Central Park too. We all like to think we do. This is why we need the money because we have made a commitment that no one had made before in the park's 160 years not only to maintain the park today, but to maintain it in the future for all of us today and for photographers and others uh, for the future. So here are all 400 of us and we have an endowment, but we always need members because um, the park, the more beautiful you make it, the more people come, and when more people come, you need more people to maintain it. So if you can, please pass the word around, and I want to thank you, and I will welcome you and see you all in Central Park this week. Thanks. <laughs> 
Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.